thank you for attending this talk. Uh, I'm Mo, and this is a joint work with my colleagues and my uh, advisors at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And today I want to talk about uh, single sign-on. However, I'm not going to talk about uh, implementation flaws or bugs in uh, SSO protocols. Instead, I'm going to show, uh, show you the attacks that are enabled by single sign-on, even when it, uh, single sign-on is implemented correctly. So let's have a quick look at what we're referring to as single sign-on and how it works in the front end and back end. So generally, single sign-on means you have uh, one main account and use that one main account to log into uh, different services or different websites. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have a, you can use your Facebook account to log into uh, various websites such as Quora, uh, Pinterest, and so on and so forth. So let's have a look at what happens uh, behind the scene. This is a, a high, uh, high level view of uh, the protocol. So uh, suppose that the user wants to use Tinder and wants to use uh, her own Facebook uh, account to log into Tinder. Then the browser gets redirected to the uh, identity provider, which is Facebook in this case, and Facebook authenticates users. Uh, if the user is not already uh, uh, logged into the Facebook account, Facebook asks for the username and password. If the user is already uh, logged in, Facebook automatically uh, authenticates the user. And after, the, uh, after Facebook agrees to share information with the relying party, the browser redirects uh, to the relying party site, in this case Tinder, with the uh, authorization code. And then uh, Tinder uses that authorization code to retrieve necessary tokens and use those tokens for obtaining further information from the identity provider. So the key point here we should uh, note that is after this process, the common method that relying parties uh, use to authenticate is through uh, setting persistent cookies on the client side. So single sign-on is very usable. Uh, it's very convenient way of using a lot of different service uh, through one account. However, this comes with a price because uh, an attacker who can take over that IDP account can also access all of those services. And as we see in later slides, because of the interplay between single sign-on and local account management, recovering from the IDP account compromise uh, becomes very hard or even impossible for victims. So the architecture of single sign-on makes the IDP accounts uh, very valuable because of the access it provides to a lot of different accounts. So in our work, we focus on the aftermath of IDP account compromise instead of focusing on how it is compromised. However, we will demonstrate some uh, examples to show, that, uh, to show how the account can be compromised in real-world scenarios. So in our threat model, we consider two methods of uh, IDP account compromise. Phishing, which is the main type of, uh, sorry. Phishing, is the, which is the main type of, uh, the most common type of account compromise. And also, uh, phishing provides uh, access to the username and password. We also focus on the uh, cookie hijacking because uh, it, uh, it can affect even cautious users who do not fall into phishing scams. We, we chose these uh, two main attacks because we wanted to capture the, uh, the attacker who has different level of uh, capabilities and technical, and the attacks that have technical difficulties. So you might think that uh, cookie hijacking uh, would never happen. Like It's a decade-old problem, and it's not going to happen after uh, this long time. We have TLS encryption on all, uh, all of these uh, mechanisms. Uh, however, uh, I would like to show that the cookie hijacking, cookie hijacking can happen, and it can happen for even major services such as Facebook. So uh, we started by auditing uh, Facebook main uh, applications in major platforms, and we found that uh, Facebook iOS uh, in-app browser uh, leaked session cookies in, uh, when the user visited some websites. So an attacker in the middle of the traffic could have captured those session cookies, and by replaying those uh, session cookies could have completely taken over the account. And we also found out that if an attacker used that session cookies to take over the account, the attacker session uh, didn't show up in the uh, victim's Facebook active sessions. So in a lot of our attacks that we are discussing, having a password doesn't provide, uh, doesn't provide it's not necessary. But in, sometimes it provides some uh, more stealthier attacks and provides longer access. 
So we also found a bug in uh, Facebook that allowed uh, an attacker to overwrite the existing password without having access to the current password. So uh, to measure the scale of this problem and to understand that how many users were actually affected by this problem, we monitored uh, our university's wireless traffic for the du uh, duration of four months. And we were able to collect more than 5,700 uh, session cookies, which allowed a complete account takeover. So we also needed to understand the scale of the access the attacker can gain uh, to other services through this uh, IDP, uh, IDP account hijacking. So we measured the prevalence of a single sign-on in the wild by building a crawler which crawled Alexa's uh, top one million. And we looked, at, uh, we looked for 60, uh, 65 well-known IDPs and uh, corresponding relying parties. So our results showed uh, more than 6% of the website supported single sign-on, and Facebook was a prominent IDP with the uh, most coverage. However, we have, to, uh, we have to keep in mind that because websites uh, do not, generally do not follow a specific appro uh, approach and implement single sign-on differently, uh, our measurement is just, uh, our measurement uh, represents a lower bound of what is actually out there. So it turns out that a single sign-on ecosystem is much more complex than we thought. There are some relying parties out there that act as an IDP. For instance, uh, if, a, if an attacker takes over a Facebook account, the attacker can directly compromise uh, a, a line party, in this case, for instance, uh, at the time we experimented, uh, Bitbucket, uh, which is a line party of Facebook. So uh, because Bit uh, Bitbucket is also an IDP for GitLab, the attacker can also compromise GitLab accounts, while the GitLab account doesn't uh, directly support Facebook as an IDP. So uh, our analysis showed that uh, Basically, half of the IDPs uh, expose this dual behavior. And uh, this, this creates two main problems. Uh, the attacker can increase uh, coverage by uh, this dual behavior. And also, this behavior can hide the origin point of the account compromise. So it turns out that uh, half, uh, so uh, we, we tested our data set and we found out that uh, an attacker who can take over Facebook account can increase the coverage by 3.1% in Alexa's top 100,000. So uh, here, the green nodes are the nodes, the relying parties are directly uh, support Facebook, and the red nodes are the nodes that uh, can indirectly compromise through, uh, through this dual behavior. So uh, for our study, we considered uh, two main attacks. First, we examined the practicality of relying account uh, takeover using Facebook, uh, hijacked Facebook cookie. Then we, introduce, uh, we will introduce a novel attack that can only happen due to the interplay of single sign-on and local account management. So uh, we should know that we have many variations uh, in our attacks, and uh, we have a lot of details. And uh, we encourage you to read the paper for, for uh, full details. So for the first attack, we selected 29 uh, major services from Alexa Top 500 and uh, 66 iOS applications from top categories of the time. So first, we examined the feasibility of the Relying Party account takeover using those hijacked Facebook cookies. And then we investiga investigated the visibility of the attacks to the victims. And finally, we explored the length of the access the attacker can maintain and whether she can prolong that access. So uh, there's an option in, uh, for relying parties that can, they can explicitly ask the identity provider to authenticate users using username and password even if the user is already logged into the ID, uh, IDP account. We found out that the majority of the services didn't use this uh, option, so uh, we were able to basically take over all of those accounts using just hijacked Facebook cookies. And we also noted that none of the relying parties uh, notified uh, notified the victim of suspicious, any suspicious activities. So in our experiment, we saw multiple unexpected behaviors 
uh, in the apps were tested. For instance, in one uh, instance, uh, a dating app kept messages unread when the attacker was reading the messages. Or in case of an Uber, we, uh, we, we expected that Uber would uh, recognize that two devices from two different locations are accessing to one account, but we were able to uh, track the person who was sitting in a car from another location, and we were able to see the past trips, and we were able to even uh, tip the driver on behalf of the person. So uh, here we consider the case that the attacker might lose the access to the IDP account. For instance, the victim might change the password. And we wanted to find out a way, uh, we wanted to find out what options are possible for the attacker to pro prolong that access or maintain that access. So uh, one, implement, uh, one implication of offering single sign-on in addition on uh, traditional user, uh, user password authentication is that the attacker can create a separate path by gaining the initial access through single sign-on and then switching back to email and password authentication after that. So we tested a subset of our data set and we found out that uh, we found out that basically half of our samples didn't require any sort of password for uh, modifying those emails. So here's an example, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in Booking.com, that not only Booking.com allowed uh, modifying the emails, but also sent the uh, confirmation email to the newly added uh, email rather than the current one. So uh, we also found, uh, we also developed another attack that uh, allowed maintaining uh, long-term long access to the Reliant Party by linking two separate Facebook accounts to one Reliant Party account. So in this case, for instance, the attacker, when the attacker takes over the Reliant Party account, uh, and this is the uh, victim's Reliant Party account, the attacker can disconnect Facebook from the Reliant Party account and by logging into her own Facebook account and then reconnecting back to the, uh, reconnecting the relying party to the Facebook account, the attacker can create a separate path to the account with another, face, uh, with another Facebook account. So this, uh, this, brings, uh, this provides a very stealthy attack as it leaves no trace and uh, no trace for the user because it's, uh, there's nothing visible here for the user to uh, see something is going on. And recovering from this attack requires tremendous amount of manual work because the, the user should go through all of those relying parties and disconnect the uh, Facebook and then reconnect back to be able to recover from the attack. So, so far we've talked about the attacks uh, on relying parties that the victim already has an account. Now we consider the case that the attacker is interested in a relying party, but the victim doesn't have an account with yet. For instance, let's say that Uber. And we are interested in an attacker who lays a long-term trap by creating relying party accounts, relying party accounts preemptively, and waiting for the victim to uh, try and create an account. So traditional credential-based authentication makes a distinction between account creation and login. For instance, Creating an account that already, that already exists shows, shows an error as it's shown here. However, based on our observation, single sign-on abstract the fact that the uh, account already exists and shows no visual difference between these separate actions. Therefore, pr uh, therefore prior existence of a relying party account is not apparent to the victim if the attacker preemptively creates the, creates the accounts with the uh, single sign-on. So in our examination, we uh, saw that a lot of service, a lot of relying party services use, for instance, only a single button like sign up with Facebook or login with Facebook or continue with Facebook. And some other websites used, uh, for instance, two separate buttons for login or uh, account creation. However, we uh, didn't, not uh, didn't notice any sort of difference between these actions. And the uh, final outcome was the same, no, no matter which uh, one of these buttons were very pushed. So far, we focus on the attacker side, and now we, we want to focus on the user side and see what sort of uh, recovery uh, actions are available to the user so that the user could uh, basically use to recover from the attack. So a two-link chain is created when the user goes through the single sign-on. 
uh, single sign-on process, and the same goes uh, uh, for the attacker. So suppose that the user becomes aware of uh, any suspicious activities, and then the uh, user tries to uh, basically cut the attacker's access out of the uh, identity provider by logging out and changing password and invalidating all of the active sessions. However, uh, as long as the relying parties' per persistent cookies are valid, or secondary authentication path exists between the attacker and the relying party, a link between the relying party and the attacker uh, remains intact. So in our experiments, we wanted to understand the available recovery options and whether these recovery options are effective uh, in an actual, in a real scenario. So we assess the effect of various remediation actions on attackers' access to the relying party, such as logging out, logging, uh, logging out from the IDP, logging out from the RP, resetting, changing IDP password, and uh, we wanted to test that if these uh, actions are actually effective. So it turns out almost uh, basically 75% of the services uh, in these services recovery actions had no effect on attackers' access to relying party service. More importantly, more than 89% of the services did not provide, uh, did not offer any sort of uh, session management to the user so that the user could invalidate those active sessions. So for instance, uh, we also found a very uh, strange behavior between uh, multiple services. For instance, Goodreads, in Goodreads when we revoked the access from the, uh, we revoked the access, it only affected the web access. It, it didn't affect the uh, mobile access. And also in CAC, uh, partial read access always remained no matter what action, uh, actions the user took. So given that uh, prevalent single sign-on schemes uh, can't prevent all of the attacks we've discussed here, we designed single sign-off and extension to OpenID Connect to address uh, such shortcomings. This is just a 30,000 view of uh, our proposal and you can find all of the design details in our paper. So uh, once the attacker has taken over the account, which is shown in step one through four, the user, suppose that the user becomes aware of the problem and initiates the revocation uh, process. So the, the user sends the revocation request to the identity provider, and then the identity provider uh, notifies all of the relying parties that the user has account with and revokes uh, all the tokens of those relying parties. Then all of those relying parties should uh, invalidate all of the active sessions and all of the uh, relying party accounts should be frozen until the victim re-authenticates through uh, single sign-up. This makes sure that uh, all the attacks we discussed here, uh, kind of, it is a countermeasure uh, of all the attacks we discussed here. So just a quick recap of uh, my main points. Uh, so we showed that not only single sign-on can uh, can play in an attack amplification role, but also it can create new attack vectors which were not possible with the traditional credential-based authentication. We also showed that in most services, there is no course of action the victim can take to remediate the account compromise uh, after, to remediate, remediate the account compromise. Finally, we propose a strict uh, universal revocation scheme to address uh, the attacks that are enabled by uh, single sign-on. So uh, please read the paper for all the missing details, and feel free to contact me for any questions, suggestions, or concerns. We also made our uh, single sign-on prevalence data set available to public at the uh, following address. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Any questions? We're going to end up with getting to the refreshments early, it looks like. You have a question. Hi, my name is Brian. Um, Great talk. I had a, a question about the revocation, the, <clears throat> excuse me, proposal for the revocation. Um, so in the scenario when the victim's account gets hijacked due to phishing, 
is this something that the attacker could use as well to lock out the victim? So the thing is, uh, the way that we proposed uh, this countermeasure is that all of the attack, all of the accounts are will be frozen until the user uh, uses single sign-on to log into those accounts. And and we also consider the uh, consider the part that the user should also uh, basically the RDP account is also uh, uh, locked out and the attacker cannot access to, to that account. And through some sort of like two-factor authentication, the user can recover access to the RDP account and again, uh, enable all of those or uh, recover all of those uh, relying party, uh, compromised relying party accounts. Okay, makes sense, thanks. Hi, my name is Daniel. Have you had any feedback from the single sign-on providers on your revocation um, suggestions? We uh, basically, during our uh, process, so there were multiple disclosures. One was for Facebook, that the, uh, Facebook fixed the vulnerability. And the other was the disclosures to the apps that we examined. Um, some of them had contact information, some of them didn't have. We also contacted the uh, authors of uh, OpenID Connect, and uh, we are happy to uh, basically collaborate with them for uh, implementing this and including this for the OpenID Connect in uh, further versions. Any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker.